they're usually part of a larger archive of materials, so they are already pretty contextualized within the, the film production, um, whatever that production may be. Um, I, I almost feel like they, they could be highlighted more um, sometimes, and uh, when you talk about sort of that I mean, everybody loves going into an exhibition and you know going into a gallery space and feeling like they're um, in a different space, in a transformative space. Like you're talking about the Ishioka um, exhibition. Um, that's in a lot of our exhibitions. That's not really possible because there, there's you know there's, you got to read the memos, <laughs> which is very important. Um, uh, and, and so we have a lot of different, we have a lot of text-based, you know, paper material, um, photographs. Um, so we're not sort of, uh, there hasn't been an exhibition done yet at the Ransom Center where you're sort of walking into this transformative space and just seeing costumes. Um, and actually with the Gone with the Wind exhibition, um, I ended up uh, doing a, a uh, special training with the docents there because they were finding that visitors wanted to know more. They wanted to know more about the costumes because um, there were there was so much great contextual material about how the production was made and what was going on each month of the year while it was being made, and uh, we had to cut a lot of that label text, and so there wasn't a whole lot of information um, there about Plunkett's process um, about you know, what he was thinking about with the design, how he was bringing in sort of contemporary 1930s fashion and melding that with fashions of the 1860s and 1870s. So, and docents were saying, people want to know more, they want to know more about these costumes and we're not quite sure what to tell them. And so, uh, so we did sort of do a, an additional training so that, that people could talk more about the costumes on, on, on tours. But um, I think that the costumes are all because they're coming in with an archive of large materials, like, for example, the Robert De Niro collection, too. It has all of his screenplays, research material, um, film stills, just uh, all manner of production material that goes along with the costumes and props. Um, well, I, as I mentioned, I work with published uh, primary and secondary materials. Uh, I don't work with a costume collection. It's obviously an area of research, uh, personal research interest. So I can just reflect on my experience of um, attending exhibitions and sort of what works for me and what my ideal dream would be to see for a costume collection. Uh, it was talked about earlier in one of the panels about movement. Um, so I uh, can refer to, um, again, some interview or written text about an exchange between Betty Davis and Edith Head in, in looking at costumes for All About Eve. And there's a, you know, I'm, I'm going to butcher this, but the general idea was Betty Davis like walked across the room and flung herself on the couch. And Edith Head said, well, what are you doing? That's not in the script. And she said, but I'm going to do it. So I sort of <laughs> made sure that this costume is going to move with me. And then the other reflection I'll say is that the Philadelphia Museum of Art um, did an amazing exhibition um, of a man named Roberto Capucci, who is just the most brilliant fashion designer I've ever seen. And he, it was very important in this exhibition that they had video of models wearing the clothing. And that, to me, just you see the dress, you see the construction, and then you see what it looks like in movement. So I was thinking so much, and then again about the, the Elizabeth Taylor dress for Cat on a Haunted Roof. Just remember her running down the steps, and she's able to flow with this gorgeous white dress. So I think maybe for, for exhibitions, it would be really nice to see the reference not only to all the contextual material, but video or construction about movement. Yes, I agree. I think that we all um, that that's one way of kind of um, putting back walked out in a certain sense. I want to cover one more thing and then we're going to open this to questions for the audience. And this is just about relic conservation. What do you remove? What do you take? Just in a general sense. Because if we're really thinking about personalities and memory and um, the actor, the character, the history, and um, I'm intrigued by the Robert De Niro pieces that have all these like scars on them. So. What do you decide to remove, and what do you what do you keep? This is an old argument, Nancy. 
sometime in the 70s, there was a Constitution Society of America meeting in Philadelphia, and there was a great argument about sacred soil. And, you know, do you remove the perspiration stains? Um, all that kind of thing. Well, fortunately, Ms. Hepburn didn't seem to perspire, so we haven't had that trouble. But it is, it is a question. Um, to preserve the piece, sometimes you do need to clean it um, because dirt can be very damaging. So you really have to make a case-by-case -case judgment as to what kind of conservation you undertake. Um, when it's like mending or stabilization, there's not so much controversy because you can, you can undo it. It's reversible. But if you do something that is not reversible, then you really, you really have to make a very serious judgment. In the auction context, we typically don't, um, so we have the pieces for usually a few months before they're up for sales. We typically don't suggest large restoration projects or anything like that. Um, but because, you know, the people who buy it might have a different view on that, so we don't want to lose buyers by having something taken too far in, in, in one person's view. Um, but it's interesting to it's a little bit gross, but about sweat stains. <laughs> the Judy Garland costume we have has you know, perspiration stains around the neck, which I think is sort of a positive in, <laughs> in this context because, again, it's very much a relic, you know, it's the body. Um, and when we're talking about costumes, um, you know, as most people know, a lot of them have multiples. There are probably 10 of those, so that's one of the ways we know that it was actually worn. Also, um, the studio dry cleaning tags are very important for us. <laughs> Um, because we know, you know, that was the one. There might be ten other ones that never got worn, um, but having that that dry cleaning tag is important. So think about that in your everyday life. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't have that much to add other than um, you know I think that it's um, it's a case by case basis, and you want to uh, preserve the integrity of the object at the same in the historical integrity of the object at the same time as you want to make sure that it lives for the ages. Um, the only example that I can think of is, um, you know, I'm, I'm very much steeped in, in all things Muppets lately. We're getting ready to open um, an exhibition about, a permanent exhibition about the work of Jim Henson. So we are um, conserving puppets. Um, and what that means for us um, in a lot of cases is taking a lot of the insides out because they are scot foam, they're crumbling, they're toxic, they off gas. It's like everything you can imagine that's really, really bad for a collection, the insides of the puppets are doing. So we are, um, you know, we have to make that choice of taking the stuff out of the inside and leaving the exteriors as they are um, in, in most cases. But, um, um, you know, preserving them for the ages that way. Luckily, we have the some of the same people that build the puppets doing that conservation for us, so we feel a little bit less bad about taking the inside out of them. Yes, this is a subject I could go on and on about, so I'll just uh, uh, try and uh, just think of a few examples. I mean, all the De Niro pieces um, that I showed, um, that's something that we would never alter. It's the evidence of the performance, and so you just try and keep it, you know, in climate control conditions and uh, monitor it. Uh, the fake blood that's on costumes, those are all uh, proprietary recipes, so sometimes you don't know exactly what's in them. And we have uh, fake blood that's deteriorating at different rates and doing different things. And so the best you can do is, is just kind of monitor um, monitor the, the garment. But uh, the conservation work of the Gone with the Wind costumes, I think, was one of the most fascinating projects. I, I, ever participated in, um, when you're talking about what, what do you take and what do you leave. Uh, the gowns had such a rich life post-production before they even came to the Ransom Center that it was sometimes hard to unpick what was, uh, what was done in production, what was done afterwards. Um, for example, the, the ball gown, the sort of poster girl um, for this conference uh, gives a couple of really uh, uh, fascinating examples. There had been uh, many feathers that had been added, especially to the shoulders um, over time, and you could, tell, uh, you could tell which ones had been added later by the color, by the texture. The original ones had actually been sort of hand curled 
with threads um, going up the stem and, and sort of shortening as they got to the end. And uh, we're really not sure when those uh, feathers were added, but we decide we're like, okay, what are we going for here? And we were going for sort of Walter Plunkett's original vision as how it was going to be seen on screen. So we made the decision to, to remove those feathers. And it actually looks quite different than it did when we showed it in 2010 um, before the conservation work was done. Um, and then there was a, a, there was a, a situation with the hem where there were lead weights sewn into um, little compartments on the train so that it would sort of train elegantly behind her, um, which you actually never see on screen. You never see um, the back of the dress. But there were all of these uh, stress points and uh, really weak areas, some holes where over time, uh, you know, the, the train as it, as it was, you know, displayed, um, it went on exploitation tours, as they called it, right? that's an industry term, <laughs> uh, right after the, uh, uh, the wrap of the film to various events, uh, be shown in department stores, uh, theaters, um, gala events, um, and then also it was on view at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1973 and a few other places, so we know it, it sort of had this, this rich life uh, post-production, but we had to make the decision, well, um, if we're going to show this again and it's going to be, uh, you know, pulling on all of those weak areas and the waist and the hip, do the weights really need to be in there? And that's original material that you're removing, so you have to really think about it. But we decided in the end, it, it would be better, it would be safer for the dress to do that. So um, so the weights were removed um, during conservation work. Um, actually, it was uh, actually a, a three NYU students who helped with that, um, who happened to be um, out at, at Texas at the time uh, doing an internship. So it was really great they were able to participate in that with the conservator. But we, we've kept the weights and a, a math as to which compartment they came out of and if it's ever decided in the future that they should return, um, then there's a math to, to doing so. Thanks, everyone. It's, a, it's such an inc it was an incredible conversation, and so interesting to hear all these different facets. Um, something that was so interesting that came up was the um, the curtain dress, which is is so iconic that in fact you could say the curtain dress, and a, 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 a percentage of people would know what that means instantaneously. Um, I'm actually writing the biography of Mr. John, who did the hats for uh, All Gone with the Wind. And so he, he created the, the sort of the airman's uh, folding kind of cap that she wears. But what's so interesting to me is, here you have a layer in which it's not dubbed the Vivian Lee dress in which she wears a curtain. It's called a curtain dress, which suggests that really it's the maker of the dress that becomes important there because it's that dress that was so ingeniously created, yes, by the character, but ultimately we all marvel that Plunkett created this really gorgeous dress as if it had been taken from curtains. So how would you, how do you sort of categorize that or how do you think about that, that particular instance of that dress, and there must be, I'm sure there must be others in which there are these sort of odd overlaps. Uh, yeah, that, that's an interesting question. I actually wonder when it started to be called the curtain dress. Um, if, you, if you look at records and sort of the inventory of Selznick International Pictures, um, it's never referred to as that. Or if you look on scripts or, or um, uh, screenplays, it's not referred to as that. So I, I wonder if it was after Carol Burnett's sketch, 
that it, it, it started to be referred to as as the curtain dress because that I mean even though that that dress was very very well loved and it's this you know really great sort of pivotal moment in the film and it has this really strong uh, narrative element to it you know uh, you know running through the the fibers literally um, it it really sort of entered uh, pop culture um, internationally, I think, with that with that sketch where she says, well, you know, I, I just saw it in the window and I had to have it. Uh, and so actually, I, I, I wonder how, how much that sketch had to do with the dress being called the curtain dress. And now I'm trying to remember in, in, the, in the Hollywood costume uh, exhibit at the Met in 73, if it was captioned the curtain dress in the catalog, I, I don't, I don't remember. But um, yeah, I, but but I think you, you raise a very interesting point about um, about it sort of go, going back to its to its origins and how it was made, and it's still we still don't really quite know if it's just sort of a, a, a studio or Hollywood myth that Plunkett made the dress from the same fabric as the curtains on the set. Um, we, we still don't, don't quite know that because he, he, claimed, he claimed that he did and he claimed that he uh, hung the, the fabric um, up in the window so that, so that it would fade uh, as it would if it was you know, actually made from, from the curtains. But if you look at the fading on the dress, and of course there's been a lot of intervening activity since the production, um, it, it does not, uh, it doesn't reflect uh, material that would have been sort of hung and sort of generally faded um, all over. It has these really, really pronounced sort of streaks of ochre and uh, Sort of the olive color turning sort of like a like a really light green, um, so it, it's still kind of one of those mysteries. I think there is, there is one person who's been trying to get in touch with this who claims that she does have the curtains from the set, and so if she's ever able able to bring them to Texas, um, we can see if if that is is actually the case that. Uh, that they were made from from the same material as the curtains on the set. Other questions? Great panel. Um, two questions. First is uncredited. Uh, what do you do with a costume that is uncredited, and how do you authenticate uh, where who should get the credit? Well, it's pretty difficult given the studio system in the 30s where most of the people, the artisans really working in the shops were never credited. Um, and often the, the um, person that, whose name appears on the film, if a costumer's name does in fact appear on the film, um, you never know what they did as opposed to what the artisans in the studio did. And my understanding from Shannon, and how much of this is myth, you know, I don't, I can't really say, but he said that um, he would just be called in to do things. He'd be rented out to MGM for a year or for a few months, and he'd just have to do what they told him to do. And he did. Um, and that's, that's how the, um, Omar Khayyam story came about and some of the other things. I wouldn't be able to tell you um, anything about uncredited work except that Shannon told me. The, the second question has to do with the difference between fashion and costume design for film. And the, 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 the costume in the film serves a purpose in the narrative of that film. So how do you um, it was very interesting to hear that the movement, seeing the, the, the and so when you exhibit, 
what consideration do you do to just not showing the costume, but the context in which that costume and the film mesh together? Well, that's really what Nancy referred to. If you can possibly afford a clip uh, and not get arrested, uh, you use it. Um, and we couldn't afford to buy the rights to show much of the film. So by having the stills, we tried to animate it. Um, but I think one of the things about some films in the 30s, particularly the Hepburn films, and certainly her stage work, is that people went to the movies for fashion information. And many times they would go to the movie, they'd see the dress, they'd go home, they'd cut the pattern out of newspaper, and they'd make their version. So fashion was important in, in attracting the audience, the female audience, to some of those films. You're absolutely right. Fashion and, and costume design are quite different. They serve different functions. But at a certain moment in time, people really went to the theater, they went to the movies for that information, particularly in the 1930s, I think. Yeah, I would add um, also, uh, so it's mentioned that uh, 30s and 40s that the uh, designs, the pattern designs, were published. That that, that a, a woman working, at, you know, a woman at home could actually make the designs, and then of course the move to ready to wear. Uh, so you look at uh, historic again, look at ads in newspapers and what have you. Macy's uh, would have display windows that were um, uh, uh, related to films, um, and sort of bringing out these are the highlights of our collection this season, and inspired by this film. So I think that there's always been a back and forth relationship. Um, just think about in the 70s, I mean, certainly um, Diane Keaton uh, inspiring lines of clothing and, and movements, and, and uh, so I think it's always been back and forth. So, so as a store like Zara, uh, does that replace patterns? No. Well, home sewing has sort of fallen to the side, you know, as people have been able to acquire fashionable clothing at a much less cost. But um, the Hollywood pattern, which was the published, one of the published versions, um, there are Catherine Hepburn Hollywood patterns, for example. Um, I have a question back here. Just kind of building on what you were saying about displaying Catherine Hepburn's pants and what you were saying about movement it being important to display in costumes. I just wanted to comment that I think it was so great that you had to build your own mannequins to fit the pants, but that way you were able to make them jointed so you could pose them in these animated poses that I think, I mean, she, you quoted the line about her talking about how pants allow you to move, and that was such a huge part of symbolically what they represented, and, um, and I just, I think it was really great. Do you, I don't know how typically the mannequins are that you display clothing on. Do they normally have no, movement? They're fiberglass humanoids by and large. And they are immobile and you really grow to hate them. <laughs> so do you think there should be a movement towards having more like jointed, animated? Well, yeah, it, it depends on the story that you're telling in the exhibit though too. And there's, there's lots and lots of different kinds of mannequins. Um, and if you have all the money in the world, you can build ones that completely Disappear, and so you're sort of seeing the costume as as it appeared cinematically. Um, but there's lots there's lots of options. I think I think sort of best practices are to let let the the story that you're telling sort of guide your selection, and then um, make the mannequins do that storytelling for you, yeah. help you do that storytelling. Obviously, movement was the best choice for the pants. Definitely. <laughs> but uh, I just like to add to that that um, one thing that I always like to tell people to keep in mind is how much is going on underneath that mannequin <laughs> that you're looking at in a, in whether it's a, a fashion exhibition or a film or theater costume exhibition, that there is never a mannequin straight out of the box that you'll be able to put something on and be like, oh, okay, that works. You know, there's an incredible amount of modification. Yeah, and, and underpinnings, I mean getting into underpinnings, to, to make uh, the the costumes look look as good as they do on, on exhibit, it can take days, weeks, months, sometimes if you have to build something from scratch. So. Um, just 
to build on the fashion versus costume question a little bit. Do you guys find that you feel a responsibility in your curating and researching experience to display a characterization of the costume rather than just the garment on display? Sure. And I mean, I know in my own research, I found it really rewarding when a dress, like the Lydia Linton dress, is remembered as yeah. the character's name yeah. instead of the actress's name, the design. I think that's really cool. It's like the character gets sort of a life in the piece. Well, you always need to identify the costume by the character's name, by the designer. Um, in, in your in your copy in your text your gallery text so the character is critical um, it's Terry Randall in stage door I mean you're you're gonna it's a man of honor in Adam's rib so uh, the first thing is you know costume designed by Walter Plunkett for a man of honor, for Catherine Hepburn as a man of honor in Adam's rib and that's the way you you present it to the public. Also, in terms of animation and bringing it to life, like yeah. with Catherine Hepburn. Trying, trying to replicate some of her postures. For example, we'd have a still of her sitting with her legs up next to the pants with their legs up, that kind of thing. So that there's a direct reference. One more question, the lady in the black and white. Is there a current show or film whose movie tells a larger story that you think would make a good exhibit in the future? <laughs> so who are you hankering for, either in your collection or at auction? I don't have any microphone. <laughs> Oh dear. <laughs> um, well, we don't collect performance clothes as a policy. We happen to have them, and we happen to acquire the Hepburn things, mostly because they were made by very important designers. Um, and now we're really glad we have them, and we love the fact that they belong to Catherine Hepburn, but that was not the, the initial. In impulse for collecting. Um, I don't have. I don't have. A I, would, I would just say I would reflect on what we, you know, so so much of the uh, talk this morning was the 1970s. Uh, so it's you know there were so many of these films referenced, and you know given my age, the 1970s is one of my favorite decades of film. So just uh, some of the discussion that came out this morning of just the crazy clothes in the early 70s and just this transformation, I think that would make an amazing exhibition. We, we've got them. <laughs> There's a question here. Okay, one more. Because this is our wrap up now, so we'll... Um, well, I'm wondering um, if you guys have experience with um, what the production studio, like the film production studio's role is in this like archiving um, and conserving and like collecting and storing um, costumes. Um, and, and I'm wondering like how much production studios have time or money to um, work on that because it's interesting that you guys are all working like um, establishments pretty much separate from production. Um, so I'm wondering if you have experience with like either production um, companies like throwing out costumes or like repurposing them or cannibalizing them to make new costumes, um, and maybe also if you have experience with um, whether uh, films being produced now um, or maybe in the past, um, how much production companies are anticipating um, their costumes becoming historically significant before enough time has passed to see. Um, yes, what's your experience? Um, some studios, or most of the big ones, have archives. I know, um, you know, Warner Brothers, they, they send some of the archiv archivists to the set, you know, when they're wrapping up bigger productions to pick items for the archive. 
which to me seems really difficult. You know, it hasn't been released. You don't know what people, what the audience's reaction will be, what, you know, what parts of it will be significant down the line. Um, a lot of the things we sell come uh, originated in the big studio auctions of the 70s when they um, started to clear out a lot of the old stock. Um, but, and some production companies now have auctions often online, right, as they finish, because um, they just, you know, can't continue to store uh, these pieces, and also, you know, partially to recoup some of the costs. And isn't it true that in, in the contracts now that the performers have, that the actors have, they, um, they can ask for the first option to retain certain things? Uh, that was not the case for Katherine Hepburn. All of that stuff went back into stock except that occasionally they'd give her something. Um, yeah, I think it's a really interesting, rich history, the studio's relationship with their, their wardrobes, and it's been really cyclical. Um, you know, like I just mentioned, you know, for a while they, they had these sort of vast repositories that they really used as, um, as a closet, basically, for their productions, um, and then they cleared them out. Um, you know, and so, some studios keep, um, you know, Keep, keep some of their costumes on hand, but I, I think what, what we're discovering recently is that um, some studios are finding that the costumes are valuable to them as Second Life, as they're as um, they're keeping them as assets to kind of brand themselves, to you know, as, as these as as, cost, as costume exhibits and fashion exhibits have been proven to be so popular and so successful, and people like to get sort of near these things. Um, that the studios are keeping them not for the purposes that they used to keep them for, which was just to sort of use in additional movies, but to emphasize uh, and help project their own brand and their own history. So that's been an interesting thing. So. Yeah, there are also some uh, costume shops that are doing that as well. Um, I don't know if it made a stop in the New York area, but um, the London-based uh, costume shop Cosprop um, they've been uh, uh, circulating exhibitions uh, quite a bit, and so I think there are certain costumes that they're setting aside. Uh, they're not going back into circulation, but you know because of the popularity of you know fashion and costume exhibitions, and you know the last 20 years or so, um, I think you know you know studios you know with the resources that they have, and also uh, costume shops are. are beginning to learn the, the value um, of, the, of the costumes that they have. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you panelists. Thank you for all the participants, for all the day's activities, our morning designers and our, um, our scholars, our uh, Keynote, wonderful keynote presenter, a very special thank you to Stella Grizzi and um, even our our audio. Thank you to Harry. I hope he's yes, okay. I'd like to invite you to join us. We have a small reception over um, across the lobby in what's called the Commons Gallery. Please come join us for a drink and some local cookies from Veneros. Thank you again for attending.